Greetings, this is Greg. Recently I made a video about the Boeing 727, and that video was non-technical in nature. It just covered the design philosophy of the airplane. But in the comments section, I got a lot of questions about the rumor that 727 pilots could manipulate the flaps in such a way as to get more performance out of the airplane than Boeing had really intended, and also a lot of questions about TWA Flight 841. And these two things are related, at least in my opinion, and we're going to get into that. So let's start with TWA 841. This was a flight in 1979. It was a 727, captained by a man named Hood Gibson. Now be aware there are different Hood Gibsons. There's one that's an astronaut and an air race pilot. This is not that guy, different guy. So Hood Gibson and his crew were flying along, fat, dumb, and happy at flight level 390. For purposes of this discussion, that's 39,000 feet. They suddenly lost control of the airplane and it headed for the earth and lost 35,000 feet, thereabouts, in about one minute. So it was an incredibly out of control descent. They put the landing gear down and then they were able to recover the airplane and fly to a safe landing, somewhat safe. The plane was pretty badly damaged by this and there were some injuries, but nobody died. And it's a real testament to the 727 that the plane even survived this. Most airplanes would have come apart because this thing went way over its maximum design speed and pulled over six G's during this, which is way beyond what any airliner can withstand. But the plane, like I say, not only survived, everybody lived, some injuries, but they were able to fix the airplane and it went back into service. So why did TWA 841 fall out of the sky? The reasons are contested. I'm going to give you my version, which is very closely aligned with the NTSB's version. Before we get into that, it's important to understand that an airplane does not fly ballistically. It's not all predicated on thrust like a bullet or a rocket ship. It relies on the wing, and that wing has to support the weight of the airplane at the altitude and speed at which it's operating. The flight engineer's job, or one of his main jobs in crews, is to calculate how high we can go and how fast we can go. In fact, the 727, as it burns off fuel, and it's burning off about 1,500 gallons an hour, or about 10,000 pounds an hour, so it's getting lighter and lighter as you move along in the flight. And the captain will often turn to the flight engineer and say, well, can we go up to flight level 370 now, or 390, or whatever it is? Can we accelerate to Mach 0.84, or whatever it is? So the flight engineer will be calculating these things, and often will run into a case where they can't go up to the altitude they want to go to, either because they've got a limit with the high speed Mach buffet, or low speed, the stall speed, because at high altitudes, you have a very low indicated airspeed. And if you go too slow, you get into a low speed buffet, and that comes before the stall. You don't want that. You have to operate in between the high speed buffet and the low speed buffet, and that speed range narrows with altitude. So part of the flight engineer's job is to work all this out. Now, the next thing we're going to have to talk about is the way the flaps work in the 727, because that's going to relate to our story. The 727 has a very complicated flap system. It has triple slotted Fowler flaps on the trailing edge, which do a lot of the work. But on the leading edge, it has devices there too. It has what are called slats, which extend out forward of the leading edge. And then on the inboard portion of the leading edge of the wing, it has Kruger flaps. Those don't matter for purposes of our discussion today, but just know the Kruger flaps are very effective and they work in a really weird way. They flip forward in such a way that the leading edge of the Kruger flap becomes the trailing edge of the Kruger flap. It's kind of an interesting thing. But again, the Krugers aren't important for us today. What does matter are those leading edge and trailing edge flaps. Now the flaps affect the Mach number of the airplane very significantly. When you extend the flaps, the Mach number decreases. Now rather than publish Mach number limitations for all the different flap settings, what Boeing does is they provide a maximum speed at which you can extend the flaps to varying degrees and an altitude limit. That way, if you adhere to those two things, and the altitude limit is 20,000 feet, if you adhere to those two things, never exceed the maximum flap indicated airspeed, and never extend the flaps beyond 20,000 feet or above 20,000 feet, you will never run into a mock limitation with the flaps. Now, the way that they work in the 7.2, there are detents in the flap handle. The first one is at two degrees. When you move the flap handle in the 727 to two degrees, a couple things happen. Some of the leading edge devices come out, not all of them, o not the Kruger flaps, only the slats, and then not all of the slats, only slats number two, three, six, and seven, which are pretty far outboard, but not all the way outboard in the wing. The trailing edge flaps extend to two degrees, meaning they only go down two degrees, but they go back really far. 
So they don't go down in such a way that they're going to build a big increase in drag, but they go back a whole lot, which gives you more wing area. Thus, you get a lot, a lot of lift relative to the amount of drag you get in a 727 when you go to flaps 2. What the 727 pilots back then figured out, or at least some of them, was that if you pulled a circuit breaker for the leading edge devices, and you had to pull the right circuit breaker, there were different circuit breakers for the leading edge devices, but if you pulled the correct one, then you could select flaps 2. And remember, there's no computer in this airplane. You can trick the system into doing whatever you want with these sorts of manipulations. You pull that circuit breaker, you select flaps 2. Now all the leading edge devices stay retracted, but the trailing edge devices go back 2 degrees, increasing the wing area, but not increasing the drag very much. This enabled the plane to go up to a higher altitude than Boeing really intended it to go to. And there's no question that people did this, and this worked. It required a certain amount of system knowledge to do it, and it wasn't a good idea for reasons that I'm going to get into but this absolutely was done. So what happened with TWA 841? Why did it suddenly fall out of control? The version of the events I'm going to give you is version, it's a version that's been told to me by people who would know, and it's very close to what the NTSB says happened. Keep in mind there are other versions of this event. The plane was flying along at 350, 370, something like that. The flight engineer gets up and leaves the cockpit. This was very normal back then, back before September 11th, there was no armored door and there was no procedure for going in and out of the cockpit. Flight attendants would come up all the time, pilots would go out all the time. I mean, there was a procedure to make sure somebody's flying the airplane, but, but it was not unusual to tell the other two guys, hey, I've got to get up and go out, and they just go out. That's what the flight engineer did. Now, while he was in the back, the captain decided to go up to flight level 390, an altitude which the plane at its current weight could not reach. So the captain got out of his seat went to the flight engineer's circuit breaker panel, pulled the circuit breaker for the correct one, he didn't mess up, pulled the correct circuit breaker for the leading edge devices, went back, sat down, and selected flaps two. So what happens? When you select flaps two, if you pull the correct circuit breaker, the trailing edge flaps go back to two, and remember, they don't go down much. They mostly go back, so that it increases the wing area. But the leading edge devices don't extend. This gives the plane more lift, and the plane was able then to go up to flight level 390. Everything would have been fine. The plane was flying along like that, as many 7-2 pilots flew the airplanes. I'm not advocating it. I'm just saying it happened. Then the flight engineer comes back. He sits down. He looks around, and he sees, oh, a circuit breaker popped, and he pushes it back in. As soon as he pushed it back in, the leading edge device is extended, which put the plane above its Mach limit for the wing in that configuration. Remember, the, the .90 Mach limit is for a clean wing with everything retracted. Boeing doesn't have a lot of data, because why would they, for Mach limits with the slats extended or the flaps extended. Boeing gets around that by just having an indicated airspeed limitation and an altitude limitation for this, and they were way outside of that. Now, Boeing has done some testing, and just as a point of reference, with one leading edge device extended, the plane's Mach limit lowers to 0.83 from 0.90. So that's what one leading edge device does. They just put out four of them. When those four leading edge devices went out, the plane was suddenly above the critical Mach number for the wing, and the plane fell out of the sky. The reason they were able to recover, well, there are a few reasons, but when they got to lower altitude, they put the landing gear down, which slowed the airplane down, but also the speed of sound went up, thus lowering the Mach number, and the plane became controllable again and they were able to recover. One of the things that's going on here is that, that Hoot Gibson knew a lot about the airplane, and he was undoubtedly a very skilled pilot. But one of the things you want to do as an airline pilot is use your knowledge and skill to avoid these situations. And then if fate puts you into one of these situations, that knowledge and skill can get you out. But you don't want to use knowledge and skill to move yourself closer to these dangerous situations. And that happens quite a bit. I worked at one airline, this was a number of airlines ago, in which this happened. And this was in a piston-powered twin-engine airplane. It was a Piper Navajo or maybe a Chief, some version of a Navajo. And I'm going to tell you this story because it relates to all of this. The pilot went out to the airplane. He started one of the engines. Let's say it was the right engine. It doesn't really matter. I don't remember which one. And then he finds himself unable to start the left engine because the electric fuel pump, which is needed to prime the left engine, is inoperable. So the, and it's cold outside, so there's no way he can start that left engine per the normal procedures. 
and therefore he can't go anywhere. I mean, one engine won't start. What are you going to do? Well, this guy was a real company man. He's a, you know, complete the mission kind of guy. And he had a tremendous level of systems knowledge on this airplane. So what he did was manipulate the fuel selectors in such a way and the crossfeed valve. Well, let me explain. The crossfeed valve enables you to feed the left engine from the right fuel tank. So the right engine from the left fuel tanks. Normally, right engine would be fed by right tanks, left engine by left tanks. But in the event that you lose an engine in flight, you need to be able to get fuel from one side to the other engine. That's what the crossfeed valve enables you to do. This pilot used the crossfeed valve on the ground so that in such a way that with manipulating other things, he was able to prime the left engine through the right fuel pump. He was able to use the right pump through the crossfeed to prime the left engine. And he successfully started the left engine that way. He used his advanced system knowledge and understanding of the airplane to start that engine in a situation where he really shouldn't have been able to start it. He taxied out, took off, flew the trip. Everything was going great until approaching the airport to land, both engines quit. Uh, both engines quit, it wasn't a good area, there was nowhere good to land, and uh, at this point he made the mistake of trying to land on the rooftop of a warehouse building. Those look tempting. Well, I gotta say, when you're down at a thousand feet, 500 feet, and you look at a warehouse rooftop, especially if they don't have a lot of air conditioners and stuff on the top, it looks like a big flat area where you could land, but those area, those, the roof is not anywhere near strong enough to take the force of an, of an airplane landing. I've never heard of anybody doing that successfully. It's probably happened, but it's not going to happen in a Piper Navajo. So he landed on the rooftop, went immediately right through, and was killed by uh, the structure of the building which the plane then encountered. So what happened? Well, he knew the systems really well. He managed to start the engine when he shouldn't have been able to, but he forgot to turn the cross feed off and reconfigure the fuel system for normal flight. The fuel system is now in a configuration which it shouldn't be in. And the result was that both engines were burning fuel out of one tank, out of one side of the airplane. And both engines quit due to fuel exhaustion and there, he wasn't high enough to restart them on the, the tanks with the remaining fuel and that's why he went in. So this sort of thing happens not too infrequently where somebody gets themselves into a situation they shouldn't be in. And I could give a lot of examples from that, and I think that's sort of what happened with Hoot Gibson. He knew the airplane really well. What he did worked, and I know that, that there's some dispute about whether this Flaps 2 trickery was a real thing. It absolutely was, and there's some dispute about whether it worked. It absolutely did. I know a lot of people that did this. Furthermore, I know it worked because the 727 was a really loud airplane, and one of the first problems the plane ran into in a regulatory sense is noise. A lot of airports put in place noise restrictions. You couldn't fly at all or after certain hours or whatever if your plane made more than a certain amount of noise, and the 7-2 did make that much noise. So airlines started installing what they called hush kits on the 727 to quiet them down. And there were many different hush, kit, hush kits, and they vary tremendously in expense. For example, the low-cost hush kit did only two things. One, they put a pin in the flap handle which prevented you from selecting 40 degrees of flaps for landing. You could remove the pin and select 40 in an emergency, but normally you wouldn't do that. When you're dragging 40 degrees of flaps coming into land, you've got to run quite a bit of thrust to make up for that drag, and that makes the plane louder. So to make the quiet, make the airplane more quiet on approach to landing, they limited the flaps to 30 degrees. That was part of this quieting it down. The other thing they did to reduce noise on takeoff is they restricted how much thrust you could use, which also restricted how much weight you could carry. So the low-cost hush kit really was nothing more than a promise to not select flaps 40 coming into land and a promise not to use more than a certain amount of thrust on takeoff, which limited your payload. There were progressively more and more expensive hush kits. The most expensive hush kit that I know of was on the 727-100 only. This added muffler-like things, uh, tailpipe extensions that helped quiet the engines down, it also added winglets on the airplane, which helped low speed performance so it would get up to altitude. It would get away from the ground more quickly. This hush kit also locked the flaps into the trailing edge flaps into a position that was not previously full up. So now when you selected full up, all the leading edge devices would retract, but the trailing edge flaps would not retract all the way. And that airplane in that configuration could go up to a higher altitude than it could without that hush kit. Now, part of that is because of the winglets, but most likely part of that, at least in the opinion of the people that made the hush kit, 
was in the fact that the trailing edge flaps no longer retracted all the way. So that was my version of what happened at TW841, and I believe it's correct, and it's very close to the NTSB's version. The NTSB's version differs primarily in the actions of the flight engineer, and not significantly so. The crew's version, meaning uh, Captain Hoot Gibson and his crew, their version is very different. They say they were flying along at Mach 0.815, and suddenly lost control of the airplane because a leading edge slat extended, slat number seven, which did tear off of the airplane at some point during this event because, presumably because of extremely high indicated airspeed. I don't buy this for a couple of reasons. One, I don't think a single leading edge slat would cause the airplane to go out of control. They said they were flying at Mach 0.815. Boeing investigations showed that a single slat would only lower the critical Mach number to 0.83. Thus, it would make the plane fly a little funny, but it wouldn't make it completely uncontrollable, as it clearly was in this case. That's reason number one. The other thing which makes me highly suspicious of the crew's story is that someone, and other than the crew, I can't imagine who would have done this, erased the cockpit voice recorder after the plane landed and was parked. So the cockpit voice recorder records all audible things, voice communication, warning buzzers, whatever, in the airplane. And back in those days, it was normal after a flight to erase the cockpit voice recorder to prevent the company from listening in on your personal conversations or whatever it was. So after a flight, it was normal for the pilot to reach up and press a little green button that was up on the overhead panel to erase the cockpit voice recorder. However, after some sort of incident or an accident, you certainly would not erase the cockpit voice recorder. That would be extremely illegal and, and something that you just normally wouldn't do. And if it was a case where you didn't do anything wrong, you certainly would not want to erase the cockpit voice recorder. So I don't buy these arguments that somebody else erased it or that the pilots erased it out of habit. I think this is a... a upsetting enough event to break your normal habit pattern and go, you know what, I'm not going to press that little button because the cockpit voice recorder has stuff on it that's going to exonerate us from whatever is going to come our way because it's normal to always blame the pilots. As a pilot, you know that. After you land, if, if, it's, if there's been some incident, something happened, you are going to want all the evidence you have on your side. And if the cockpit voice recorder is friendly to you, you're, you're going to do everything in your power to make sure it's not erased. In fact, what you're going to do is pull the circuit breaker for the cockpit voice recorder to make sure it doesn't get accidentally erased. But that's not what happened here. They erased the cockpit voice recorder. I, happen, I have to think that the crew did that. So that plus the fact that the plane would have been controllable at the Mach number they say they were at, at that altitude with the flap extended, really casts a lot of doubt in my mind on the crew's decision. And ALPA has yet a slightly, ALPA is Airline Pilots Association, it's the union that represented the crew. They have a slightly different version of events, and with all due respect to ALPA, I, I understand their job in this case is to protect the pilots' careers. I don't think that their case is all that credible. I really have to side primarily with the NTSB on this one. So that's the story. Yeah, it's absolutely true. Pilots did, in 727s, manipulate the flap system and get more altitude capability out of the, out of the wing than Boeing had intended, and that did really work. But it wasn't a good idea, and I am really convinced that in the case of TW841, that's what caused that incident to happen in the first place. That's all I've got. Hopefully, I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye, and have a great day.